afternoon, everyone. I'm Shabir Dogman. I'm a palliative care doctor at MGH, and along with Jessica Cohen, I co-direct the LEAD Fellowship, which is co-sponsored by the Harvard Global Health Institute here at the Global Health and Population Department. Um, and we are very excited. Um, I know many of you have been ongoing, going to these brown, brown bag series and have heard a few of our other LEAD Fellows speak, but we are very excited to have Dr. Katia Bryant here today. So I will just give a very quick introduction of our fellowship and quickly introduce Kathy and then I'll let her take it away. Um, quickly, for those who aren't aware, our LEAD Fellowship is, uh, stands for Learn, Engage, Advance, and Disrupt. And that's for women healthcare leaders of change um, from global areas. And it's a year-long fellowship and we have two of our fellows, Brenda and Kathy, here today. And Larry Rosaline, we have all three fellows here today. Um, and so they have been learning and engaging remotely, and this is the second week that they are here out of six in person. So we're thrilled to have them here today. Um, and quickly, let me um, introduce Dr. Catherine Ann Reyes. She's a licensed Philippine physician and holds a Master of Public Health Policy for the National University of Singapore. She was recently appointed program lead to establish the Institute of Health Promotion and the National Institutes of Health University of the Philippines in Manila. Um, and it has a key component in implementing the country's UHC law. There's lots more I could say, but I will just give one more sentence of her introduction. She co-founded the Alliance for Improving Health Outcomes, a local nonprofit health organizations that's worked to improve opportunities for aspiring healthcare professionals in the Philippines and beyond. So thank you very much for being here, Dr. Reyes. We're very pleased to have you. And the last thing, I can't forget to say is that each speaker is responsible for their own analysis and data and interpretation of the results, and they do not speak for All right, thank you so much for that um, introduction. And let me share my slide. All right, so again, uh, good afternoon, everyone, to our um, online audience. Uh, Good morning or good evening wherever you are in the part of the world. So again, I'm Kathy Reyes. I am a physician, public health physician, and also a researcher uh, based in the Philippines. Currently, I am leading a pioneering team to establish the Institute of Health Promotion, which is part of the realization of universal healthcare in the country. So there is a um, an ob objective to expand the role of health promotion in our approach towards universal healthcare. So I'll be sharing to you um, my perspective on how this movement and how this initiative can help us advance UHC in the context of the Philippines. And hopefully this will um, also provide some um, guidance or lessons that others can learn from. Okay. So in short, of course, research. So what does research do? So basically, it will generate information. And what we want from, from that kind of research is that it will eventually help advance universal healthcare. And there are basically three ways that we can do it. So within the program, so if um, health promotion as a program or some intervention in the government, we do research in that particular context. Research will help us prioritize which health interventions to put as, uh, as uh, a priority under UHC. So basically, these are studies around understanding our understanding of prevention, early detection, and changes in behavior. The other way that research can help advance universal healthcare is really looking at the synergy between health promotion and universal healthcare because usually there is a tendency to look at this like a program uh, perspective or maybe two different strategies but research can help us look at synergies. So in particular, we can um, use research to help us consider policies, programs, and investments, and specific attention to the integration of health promotion and universal healthcare intervention in the primary healthcare level. And as UHC is also uh, very much interested in improving the efficiency of financing and human resource um, investments, then this is also a way or a way for us to use research to improve synergy in this line. And finally, the important thing that is a focus of health promotion that can help universal healthcare are studies around health-seeking behavior. 
as well as the overall um, enhancement of the knowledge system. So knowledge system starting from community up to the different levels of the health sector. And the third way that research can be useful in advancing universal health care is fostering the whole of society and whole of government um, initiative. Um, health promotion, I think, um, uh, among all the other programs is the um, field wherein we are very much concerned about being able to work together with the different uh, branches of the government, as well as the different um, aspects of society. So here, research can help us again align priorities, policies, and investments, address social determinants of health, um, also settings-based services because health promotion is usually regarded across settings. So this can be in um, schools, in communities, workplaces. So these are not exactly within the purview of the health sector, but which can be an entry point for health interventions. And also recently, digital health, which is basically being used also for like health promotion intervention, is something that is a concern of whole of society because it requires infrastructure outside of the capacity of the health sector. So this is also another area that health promotion can also help advance discussions around this. And finally, climate change, especially in the context of the Philippines. Okay. All right, so just a brief background. Philippines is a country with 109 million people, um, currently classified as a low middle income country, but we're expecting for a reclassification maybe two years down the road. This is an archipelago with a decentralized healthcare system. We legislated universal healthcare back in 2019. Um, we have had some progress in terms of our key health outcomes. So throughout the years, you can see that there are improvements. However, we are still behind our targets and we are also um, lagging compared to our neighbors. So uh, what our government is monitoring right now are life expectancy at birth. So these we are within targets. Maternal mortality ratio, we are still far off from our target. Infant mortality rate. Tuberculosis is still a huge problem in the country, stunting, as well as out-of-pocket expenditure. And the universal health care was signed in 2019 specified that all Filipinos will be included in the national health insurance program. So this might be a little strange that population coverage is assured through an insurance enrollment, that, but that's the direction that the country is going. So meaning the direction is to have one strong purchaser of health services. So the coverage is, is um, assured through enrollment in this national health insurance program, which is conceptually a social health insurance system. In terms of services, there is also an explicit um, a, a, a inclusion, a, rec a recognition that preventive and promotive services will be prioritized. No? So together with curative, rehabilitative, and palliative care. And as you can notice, there is also a commitment to strengthen primary health care and com comprehensive outpatient benefit package. So the direction is really to strengthen the base, the community level base of the health services. So which is a very strong opportunity for health promotion to play um, uh, an important role in universal health care, at attainment of universal health care targets. And finally, for financial protection, what the government did was to uh, classify the health services, whether these are population-based services or individual-based health services. So health promotion falls under population-based services because usually you uh, provide the intervention with uh, like a population in mind compared to services that can be traced directly to a patient. So population-based services, including health promotion, will be funded by the national government as well as local governments. The individual-based um, services, on the other hand, will be paid through uh, prepayment systems as much as possible. So um, here, the intention is really to ensure that we reduce out-of-pocket services um, as we proceed to the realization of universal health care. 
And with that, in the context of UHC and also in health promotion, we have to recognize that a lot of our sufferings, uh, I'll show you the data later, health issues are mainly due to chronic diseases. And there is a study that attributes chronic diseases as mainly influenced by a lot of factors that are beyond our um, health, what we can do in direct point of care services. So these are um, our environment as well as our socioeconomic situation. And if you will notice, a lot of these factors are beyond the individual's control. So meaning if we want for, for health promotion to be an important factor in the region, we have to pay close attention to factors that are outside of what we expect our patients or, or our population are able to do. So um, it's, it's important that in universal healthcare, we recognize the role of health promotion. As WHO, it is, um, it is defined as that process where it we uh, provide more agency to our population. So we give them more ability to control and make decisions about their health. And also it, it raises the relevance of the role of government and the whole of society. Because again, a large portion of what makes health promotion work is really not in the control of individuals, but rather decisions have to be made by government or by the entire society to make to provide that healthier environment for people to thrive. So I'll start with the first point about using health promotion research so that we can better guide our intervention. And in the, in the area of health promotion program, basically this uh, goes around being able to um, prevent diseases or being able to detect this early on, as well as also changing behaviors. So studies, for example, that are able to um, help us characterize the health concerns of individuals, understand risk factors, and also measure levels of health literacy are important contribution. Um, we also can do studies around prevention, early detection ser services. How can we do it better? And also um, information on access to intervention for healthier choices. So how can we make it easier for people to make healthier choices, like eating, um, being active, so on and so forth. And of course, in the context of universal healthcare, uh, we have the uh, resources. So usually we are very interested around being able to target. So which population groups uh, what are in what setting, as well as very important um, in our context, cultural appropriateness, because we do have um, subsets of the population that are um, driven by different belief systems. And that's very important to consider when um, uh, putting in interventions for health promotion. And of course, um, studies around effectiveness and equity because there's a lot of theory, what can work. Um, so we need studies to ensure that we're implementing effective ones, especially for interventions that we plan to roll out to a wider set of population. And very important, again, for UHC is a way for us to prioritize so that we can use resources efficiently. So in the context, for example, uh, in the Philippines, our top burden of diseases um, for morbidity and mortality. You see here still the role of chronic diseases, although we do have a double burden um, at the moment, we still have infectious diseases together with um, non-communicable diseases, but in terms of relevance, um, chronic diseases are really uh, placing a lot of burden in our health system. And in Looking at it, for example, smoking. So smoking is one of those that causes a lot of chronic diseases. So for us to understand better how to counter smoke, smoking, we need to do studies. So for example, uh, we understand that exposure is a very important determinant. We also do prevalence studies to know the amount of burden is like what is and We also do studies to understand, um, again, um, where is this happening more? So for smoking, we see that um, having exposure at home, um, usually uh, people start young and, they, uh, and those who are living in their household would likely be um, smokers compared to their other counterparts. So with that information, then we can help 
create layers of intervention. Um, so health promotion will look at it from different perspectives. So for example, you use economic intervention, like putting in taxes to curb uh, the use of harmful substances. You can, example, ban the use of harmful substances in certain environment. And also, you can put information so that people can make decisions on, um, on this kind of behavior that we want to lessen. And of course, there are also like other studies. I just pulled out some recent studies that are being done that can potentially help how we uh, create our intervention. So there's a rise of interest around mental health. Um, also lo looking at determinants of uh, using preventive um, health services like uh, condoms, so on and so forth. So we can definitely uh, use research in the government that we guided in this program. Uh, the second part that I'd like to um, point out is that in looking at health promotion, again, in the context of universal health care, while in concept they are together uh, because people are involved in shaping what happens in health promotion, what happens in universal health care, there is a tendency for them to have these synergies as a uh, Commission. So in 2023, there was a commission that um, examined how to maximize the interaction across universal healthcare, health promotion, and health security. Because there are these are like cross-cutting agenda in our government, but are typically developed by different people. And uh, there are different uh, technical teams that look into this. So what happens is if we don't put the effort to uh, maximize their synergy, then you, there's a lot of... Um, uh, benefits that we are actually lose out and we also have uh, we will also end up like stretching the resources that are that we have in our um setting so these are some of the sources of elements uh, identified in that commission so therefore um if we are to use research to maximize alignment and reduce the the, the synergy then we can um Think of researches in health promotion that can help us improve um, in uh, programming policies and investments, and also specific attention on what's happening at the primary healthcare level. Um, there is a strong push for a primary healthcare based universal healthcare. So, definitely, there will be a lot of investments going to um, integrate primary healthcare services. So, it will be a missed opportunity if we don't like create. Um, generate evidence to understand how we can maximize alignment at the primary care level. So this is also the same uh, in terms of financing primary health care, because sometimes there is a tendency to fragment the uh, financing. Human resource capacity. Uh, in as, as many programs we put in at the primary care level, we only have like a few people in there. So basically, um, we would like for them to be trained, of course, with primary health care services. But since they are also the ones who will be facing our patients, who will be facing the communities, it's also important that they have the capacity to actually recognize opportunities for health promotion intervention, as well as promote these kinds of services at the community level. And as I mentioned, Research on health-seeking behavior is usually categorized under health promotion, but these kinds of study are basically helpful across services at the primary care level. And I'd like to highlight here knowledge systems. Um, when we think of knowledge systems, we think of like the formal research infrastructure, right? So we have researchers, academics, um, and usually you also have the funders at government. Health promotion allows us that opportunity to go deeper, so basically make our communities part of the knowledge system. So therefore, this is an opportunity to make them participate on the kind of information that we're able to generate. So here, for instance, uh, these are the kind of studies uh, we can think about. And basically, the goal is to ensure that as we go to the primary care level and as we expand universal health care, our policies are always research driven. That's why the opportunity to actually go to the community and make them part of the knowledge system is very important because we know that as we roll out implementation of universal health care, there will be new one's knowledge that will other, otherwise be lost if we don't take this opportunity. So in the 
in the universal healthcare of Philippines, research is actually uh, considered as part of the vital intervention to expand health promotion activities. So in our health promotion agenda, um, here I, I put in the red box, these are interventions, so these are in Filipinos that are referring directly to um, health promotion. So pag-iwas ng sakit is avoiding disease. And the number uh, six agenda is on mental health. So these are um, directed to health promotion. There, there is an explicit uh, recognition that health promotion is part of what will make health uh, UHC work for the Philippines. So it's, also, it's there. It's written as part of the strategy. And also, um, given that importance, the government also created a very specific list of priorities where health promotion will be um, will be very important. So in the action agenda, they define the, the programs where health promotion research, health promotion intervention will be um, very important. Okay, so just for example, um, this study on well-being of Filipino healthcare workers during the COVID pandemic. So although this was a health promotion study, but if you improve the welfare of healthcare workers, it will also in a way help them do their other jobs, maybe not related to health promotion, but uh, it is something that can cut across their function as they are doing their uh, work in the healthcare sector. And finally, the, the last thing that I'd like to highlight where health promotion research can also shed light into is fostering collaboration. So again, uh, this is the um, part wherein we would like to enjoin the other sectors of the government, even those out outside of health and the other members of the society so that they, we can work together for better health. So here we also can use research to align priorities, policies, and investment uh, because there are different parts of the governments that look into, let's say, uh, development. Uh, another um, uh, part of the government works into economic uh, growth, um, another one on finance, but their scope of work can actually be uh, entwined with what we need to make health promotion intervention work. Social determinants, a very important aspect of health promotion, does not only uh, fall under the mandate of the health sector. So we have, let's say, the social work, the education sector, um, that are important um, allies that we need to bring into in doing our studies for building uh, health. So this is as I mentioned this earlier. So this is an important uh, sector that we're attention to. So the schools, the workplaces, as well as some of the com community uh, settings where we can put in interventions for health. And the last two are more, more recent developments around digital health and climate health. Um, so these are two things that are also now under the radar of health promotion. So digital health being, um, there are a number of like digital apps, for example, that people are trying into, but these are right now in uh, like a pilot mode. But if you want to, let's say, scale this up, you need a very good data infrastructure that can make it work so that it does not only benefit those who have access, but it should actually reach those who need it more. And finally, for climate health, um, so right now what we are looking at is basically around mitigation measures and also people being aware how climate is impacting their health and maybe there are some things that they can do so that they are not heavily affected. So health promotion is also taking this on right now in government. So for research, uh, we can, of course, contribute in terms, again, of aligning um, policies and priorities. Uh, we can also do research. This has actually been expressed also by government. They, need, they want to understand more how to make governance across sectors work because it's always something that we want to do, but um, in terms of being more effective about it, actually studying how to do it better is something that we can explore. Community ownership is also uh, a topic that is important right now. And also the more difficult one, the political economy of healthier environments, because it has different um, nuances if we look at urban settings in rural settings. And we need to understand more how to work with communities so that we can um, put together uh, a holistic approach towards health promotion. 
So for example, uh, there are right now, most of the focus on settings-based studies are in the school places. So that's one area where we want to strengthen the linkage between the health sector and the schools. Um, but there is also a strong interest right now to look at workplaces as another sector. Okay, so again, um, there are three ways that we can use health promotion research to attain or advance universal health care. And in the context of our health sector, um, the researchers eventually should be able to contribute to these key indicators that the government set up. So for the government, this is what they are using now to guide all of the activities as well as investments. So as you will notice, we're looking at literacy, decision-making, health-seeking behavior, as well as healthier settings. So the opportunities out there is that we do have an enabling environment for evidence-based culture practices in the country. So we have a supportive law, there is a regular agenda setting, and the, the uh, in, investment for research is currently expanding. So what I'm showing to you now is the National Unified Health Research Agenda, which is renewed every five years. And for this round, health promotion is recognized as a category, so which is good for us because that means that when you ask for money from government, uh, this is usually the reference. If you can refer to a priority, then you can be given or you can have the opportunity to be given funding. The challenges, however, for sustainability is um, ensuring that we have enabling processes and mechanisms. So particularly procurement processes for research. This remains a challenge in the Philippines um, because our procurement process, I think, is not really friendly for our research um, infrastructure. So we're still working on this. Um, it is you know, creating some tension on how we do our research, but this is something that we hope to work on. And also capacity building in the field of health promotion research and across the research steps. So we do have some limitations in terms of skill sets. So this is something that we still need to build on. And finally, because you know, you're asking for resources, you want more resources to be um, provided to generate information. And especially that this is tied to the implementation of the universal healthcare law, then we will need to be able to demonstrate the impact of these studies. So maybe three to five years down the line, we will, we will be able to say that the studies, the investments that are being made are able to make lives better. So just very quickly, um, what we're doing now um, is basically uh, creating this environment where we can have a focused agenda for health promotion, fostering a community of practice, as well as creating a stronger link between researchers and government. And in a study way back in 2009, um, there is a role for dedicated centers for research and health promotion specifically to sustain the work. You know, so you don't do the research ad hoc um, in different uh based on individuals, for example, but putting it within a research center. So in last year, the Department of Health uh, committed to set up the Institute of Health Promotion. So this is basically a step forward for them to say that, okay, we're serious about you know, creating generating things to help us improve health promotion. So this uh, was set up. And the way that we structured it so that we don't fall into the trap of doing fully research is that we intentionally put in our program plan um, the activities that will allow us to um, generate engagement within the policy environment and also continue to build capacity as well as have um, capacity for strategic communication. So um, just to give you some idea, so for this year, these are the kind of studies that we are focusing on. Um, commercial determinants and al alcohol consumption. We're also looking at tobacco. We're looking at the food system and then injury prevention. But on top of that, our stakeholders also gave us like some agenda that they uh, felt we should look into. So most of these are uh, within the health literacy and settings um, kind of studies that we need to attend. The other feature that is 
part of this um, knowledge system that is being built at the moment is the focus on participatory action research. So this is written in the law. Um, again, the purpose is really to be intentional in generating knowledge from our communities. So back in 2021, before this um, program was established, the government was able to work with different regions in the country. And these are all topics generated by the communities themselves. And in the program right now, what we're doing is we're training uh, different uh, researchers on the research methods for participatory action research. We also become the group of funding as well as mentoring support. And uh, just last year, we also trained some of them who finished their studies to how to write their paper. And we will also be publishing their paper in like a special issue. So we're sponsoring that so that they can get their studies out for others to read. And then um, again, we are very intentional with knowledge translation. So we do put effort to establish regular communication between our research team and our end user, convening communities of practice. So we just launched one community of practice for alcohol. Um, and we hope to continue our conversation around the use of evidence to influence policies on alcohol use, as well as uh, finally also embedding dissemination and communication strategies for health promotion. So again, uh, these are the three ways that we wish to contribute uh, using health promotion research to advance universal health care. But then, of course, this will need really a long-term investment in health promotion research and support from government so that we are able to sustain and ensure that the capacity is really able to generate more evidence. Thank you. Um, and... I hope I'm happy to answer any question that you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Ray. I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. And for those who are online, feel free to either raise your hand or you can put a question in the chat. Thanks. Um, this is very but look, I'm happy to see the interest in health promotion research. I think for a long time, health promotion is one of those areas that is has an inquiry chair by many governments, um, us, especially in our cities, we would want to curate um, high health system um, health interventions other than really health promotion at the base. So really glad to see that. Um, so I have two questions. One has been partially covered, um, but I'll start with a bit of uh, competing priorities, limited resources, um, and at least in our setting, the proportion of the domestic finance towards research is less than 0.5%, it's around 0.2% mm -hmm. um, of a budget, um, whether government or donor that goes towards research. How do you, and you have a whole list of research priorities and various interventions that you need to influence. How do you prioritize um, that? Right. Uh, so. Um, thank you for that question, and that is really, uh, that's an ongoing discussion, actually. And it helps, I think, for our setting because the government is very clear to how, like, we ask them exactly which of these studies you will use and in what way. Um, in the past, there has been, like, a tendency that government, for example, a fund, fund a study. And then somewhere along the way, they forgot about it. And then when the researchers submit the findings, that's not what we actually need, and that's not what we want. So for our part, uh, we try as much as possible to make engagement on a regular basis so whenever they give us a copy, and we make sure that we are very clear in what way they will use this and whether the research questions that they propose is really what they need for, for that purpose. So that's one. So uh, as much as possible, reduce the research waste. Uh, so I think what's important in our current system is we do have a regular agenda setting process. So the agenda setting process is very consultative. It starts from the regions up to the national level. So uh, we try as much as possible to capture the priorities at the region and then summarize at the national level. It's usually the basis for government funding. It's not always in the agenda. Question that I can read, and then I will get to you as well. Um, so I'll let you read, but for those who are able to see the chat, Gil Kim asked, and first said thanks for the comprehensive 
presentation and that I have a question on contractual tree disparity. This is now region is known to be a lower performer in health indicators. How the AHL government approach the issue from a health promotion angle? How does the central government's state on this region improve overall health indicators? I'd love to hear an example of how immunization promotion works in the Right. So this is this is a very important question and something that actually we've been grappling with also for quite some time. I think answer this is first um, I'll answer from the perspective of governance. Um, because our um, the question refers to a specific population that has its own culture in its own um, context. And there is a political dimension to interaction that is the result. So within that in the health sector as well um, created a governance process, implemented a governance process that allows autonomy for, for them. Um, having said that, there is still a relationship between this autonomous um, region. So basically they have their own secretary of health, they have their own um, healthcare workers. They do still um, connect with the national government in terms of standards, in terms of reporting, uh, in terms of technology. And that exchange, I think, and that relationship is very helpful. So which means that when the Secretary of Health sets an agenda, so here in the agenda, health promotion is specified as a, as a priority. So they will also likely um, align themselves with that. Now, when it comes to the specific approach, definitely it will require a specialized skill set. So you will have to work with local healthcare workers, local researchers, those who know the context, um, especially in health promotion, which is very, you know, even in this population, this is very personal, right? Because you have behavior, you want them to um, act on a, on a certain way. So you will have to work on this around their culture and around the context where they are in. So I think those are two things, the government being able to respect the autonomy, but in a way uh, provide the technology and the necessary standards that can be utilized and then respecting the local culture, local resources. They do have their own trainers and trainers. So next, I saw the Hi there. I hope you I hope you can hear me okay. Thank you, Dr. Ez, for the presentation. Um, I do research on disaster preparedness and resilience in the Philippines, and one of the things that we've uh, realized in the population-based uh, research that we do is that uh, mental health is a, is a big issue as related to uh, disasters, and with climate change, um, that's only likely to become even more um, important and salient. I wonder if you could say a little bit about the connection with the um, seeking universal healthcare and links with mental health. Thank you. Right, so this is, uh, thank you for that uh, question. Mental health is really an important, uh, recognized already as an important uh, concern. Uh, we also recently have our mental health care app. So this basically provides a framework for government to invest more in mental health care. Um, uh, so in terms of uh, research and direction of the program, I think the direction right now is to um, move it more towards the community level um, and to ensure that we have, um, let's say, in the, at the community, there are interventions that can be accessed, uh, let's say, in different settings, and also have the healthcare sector, our professionals are better trained on how to recognize and also manage refer um, because right now, in terms of capacity, we do have some limitations. So not all um, healthcare facilities are able to manage cases. And the key is really recognizing when referral is needed, for example. Um, but we still have really a long way to go. And having that legislation is a big thing so that we can uh, really invest more resources in not just in research, but also in acting upon those data, like really shaping our health uh, healthcare services to provide more uh, better mental health services for our community, especially during disaster, as I mentioned, which is also an important for us.
the focus of the, the diversity um, of the population and how that's reflected in health promotion research. So maybe I'll switch and, and ask more a little, a little bit more about sort of one of your strategic goals around building capacity in health promotion research and what is the way that you have sort of to do that right now? How would you like to continue to strengthen that particular goal? Okay, so um, that's a, also an interesting direction because we do have formal programs. So there is a health promotion, um, bachelor's and graduate degree, and do some research components. Uh, but what government is doing right now? You know, so we have two specific um, like large um, groups of research that they want to strengthen. Also, the general health policy and systems research, of course, that has different fields as well as well as participatory research. What they're doing now um, is attacking it both in the formal and informal setting. So formal, they, they set up a small fund for graduate students who are interested to do art to get funding. So in terms of thesis, get funding process. That's one thing. The other way is um, in encouraging participatory action research and when there are communities that are interested to do this we do conduct the methodol uh, methodology lessons first before they are allowed to like, do the study so they are trained with the methodology the other thing is that uh, the department of health is um, also designing so we're also helping them with this an in-service training so meaning for those who are in government and would like to have some research document maybe some research appreciation it's part it's going to be part of the budget project so it's hybrid they work with the department of health and then they work with us so they get exposed with what we do in research how we do it the kind of methodologies that we use so that uh, in case they want to get deeper sets of research that we can address that in other training program that they have as well. Yeah. Well, congratulations, Kathy, for this wonderful presentation. So I thought I was to bring that to that issue. And it's easy to see that the uh, country are not through some type of pollution. I think COVID is a lesson learned from COVID that we needed. So part of that question, I, I get some answer to your uh, replies, but I want to know how do you decide to put that into the health system because you have a shortage of healthcare worker and the primary healthcare, I guess, is not that uh, strong. So how do you build integrate now to have a promotion into that uh, existing uh, system and who will be in charge of it? Because you say you don't have um, a capacity building, you don't have that program. So how will, I mean, came from policy, came from document, came from policy strategy, to the real So that's a very important question and really a challenge for us as well. Um, so there are, there are currently interventions that the government is doing to pitch national programs to primary care. Um, but the challenge really is examining how that figures in the data to the east of our primary health care system. And I guess that's where our research eventually will also get in. So right now for our participants, we are actually at, like um, maybe use this to really understand what's happening at the service delivery level. So we ensure that the programs are implemented. Uh, there is a mechanism from national government to roll out a health promotion intervention up to the local government. Of this capacity. So our some of our staff, of course, will be overwhelmed by a lot of these activities. So whether they do it or not, or if they do it effectively or not, that will differ across the board. Um, the other thing I think is also targeting. So for example, malnutrition. Malnutrition is still a huge issue, but it happens in pockets of the population. You know, it's not exactly a problem like across the country, but there are pockets of people of uh, population that still are suffering from a lot of malnutrition. So we can start from there. Uh, when we look at our research 
um, priorities, our, our research activities, we can focus in some population that we think will be most important outcomes. It's um, health um, promotion activities. And I see that both the promotion of health literacy and also participatory um, research um, requires active involvement of community people. And I would like to know more in detail about how people are reacting toward um, this um, strategy that you're taking. Right, so right now, um, we are, since we are a new uh, team, we are currently focused on the participatory action research aspect and maybe the health literacy will be doing, I think, around next year. So what we're doing right now is we are interfacing with the regional government. So that's um, one down, one administrative level, and then to their counterpart at the local government. The main challenge, so they, they're happy about this, is it gives them an opportunity to um, examine, like spend time to actually examine their own progress. And really, they're also, I, we've seen that they are, they, they seem fulfilled being able to actually do the data collection and then examining their data and trying to understand what to do with it. The main challenge that I see at this research perspective is that since they are time constrained, so once they have the findings, they're still going to be able to actually write and publish the paper. <laughs> they're only happy that, okay, they get the data, and then they have something with it and all. But from our perspective, because we want their voices to be heard, that we want their information to be placed in like a formal, um, you know, formal repository of knowledge, uh, we really try to encourage them and encourage them and understand that they can publish their findings. To be done that um, still a challenge where we are so we have um, submitted some members still working on it kind of way for us to help them um to make sure that their knowledge is not lost like you know it's not that we can share it the other thing that we're also thinking about is coming up with like a regular dissemination activity for them um, fostering a community of practice among the par uh, researchers and uh making possible for them to share what they've learned so that for example they really are not able to publish their works at least they're able to share it with other um the other communities so maybe they're able to benefit from what they've learned from them. Thank you.